Hello, everyone, and welcome back to theCUBE's live coverage of UI Path Forward 2024. We're kicking off two days, wall-to-wall, -wall, back to back coverage. I'm your host, Rebecca Knight, alongside my co-host and analyst, Dave Vellante. Very excited to introduce our next guest, the man of the hour, the founder and CEO, the boss of the bots, yeah. <laughs> Daniel Dines. Thank you so much for, for coming back on the show. Of course, thank you for having me. So up on the main stage this morning, you talked about how this is the most seminal moment in yes. UiPath's history, which is not a very long history. I think the company is about 10 years old. Yeah. Um, you, you said this is where we really start act two. Can you tell our viewers a little bit about what act one in your mind consisted of and what is ahead for act two? Yeah, so act one was uh, really about uh, imitating people doing uh, repetitive work in uh, as long as the work was defined by rules. And the information that the people use on their work was really structured. So a robot can understand it. And it, it was actually a hard work to make it, uh, to, to make it working reliably. Because when you imitate people, it's always more difficult than when you go with other more precise ways, right? And there are also a lot of exceptions. So we had to create this orchestration piece that combine robots and humans. And humans are capable of uh, handling exception raised by robots, right? But that was that big limitation of act one. We cannot go after unstructured content of the what I call unstructured parts of a process. You cannot interact with an automation in a natural language. So you always have to be structured to put in a form like in front of an automation, send a, send a request in a very structured form. And that was really limiting because if you look into enterprise processes, many of them will have a mix of rule-based tasks and the unstructured type of, and sometimes they are intermingled. So it's not so easy to separate them. And some of our clients would not even see the benefit to go after a small rule-based part in a bigger process because they couldn't go after the entire end-to-end -end process. Now I think with second act, we, in the next few years, we have to learn how can we deploy this Gen AI technology that is capable of navigating the unstructured part. But the biggest challenge is that this technology has agency, it's non-deterministic. So how can we make a non-deterministic technology reliable and how we can deliver into an enterprise workflow context that should be reliable? That's the key element of Act 2. I have so many questions for you. <laughs> I wish we were doing like a Lex Friedman you know, podcast <laughs> yeah. and had a couple hours. Uh, so much is changing. You know, I, it's, it's interesting, boss of the bots is what Bobby called you. I feel like ace of the agents is where you're headed. Um, but I want to start with the name, UiPath. The UI is completely changing. Yeah. Right? And it's one that w w is going to become natural language. Um, and then, but not just the UI, the entire application stack is changing. So I, I want to get your vision as to how that changes, maybe at a high level, and this idea that the key component of Act One was the orchestrator, that's going to be a key component of Act Two, which is orchestrating the agents. How do you see the application stack from the UI, <laughs> the data platform, the agent control framework, how we connect to back end app? How do you see that changing? Right. Look, it's not so easy to predict, Dave. I think, I think there will be, we will see an acceleration of the transformation that probably mainframes will, will disappear faster than we anticipated. We, because AI can record probably a mainframe application in .NET or Java faster. I don't really see that UI will disappear because I think in many cases we act faster on UI than we talk. 
and I think they will uh, they will coexist yeah. in uh, in the new set of applications. What I what I think it's actually uh, the most uh, relevant transformation is how we will deliver the work itself, and uh, are we still how much are we still using the applications? we as human versus technology, how much technology will touch the applications. What, what would humans be required to do in the new way of work? Because, look, if you, if you are a uh, junior uh, investment banker, you spend most of your time building some reports and instead of uh, analyzing them. If the technology, if the AI agents will build the reports for you, you will you will get to spend a lot more time understanding that. So th this is a it's a dramatic shift in how we are gonna we are gonna work. So I think we are gonna use less applications than before for doing clearly repetitive work. So, but I'm not sure the nature of the interface. Is gonna necessarily change. You cannot act only via natural languages on application. It's I don't think it's practical. So, I just um, as you're speaking, I think that I mean it's been decades since I actually went in to and touched the database. Although I touch a database every day, but I never see it. Do you think that's what will happen with the application? Yeah, I think that's a good analogy. Yeah, you might see a lot less of the applications. But still, there, there should be a way for humans and AI to interact. We need to have a common language. And really, the language should be our language. Either natural language or the user interface metaphor. I think they will, they, they still have to exist. Because otherwise we want, AI can eventually create binary code directly and run binary code, but we are not going to understand whatever they will do. So AI should work with us on a common platform. And for, I think for many years to come, because we will, we will want to validate the outcome of AI, right? So outcome of AI should always be in a form that we can humans understand. Okay. On the main stage, you said that there will always be humans in the loop, and but at the same time, AI uh, U, UiPath is aiming to reduce yeah. the human input in the process. Yeah. So I was really interested in what you were just talking about with that hypothetical example of a, of a junior investment banker yeah. who right now is spending all of his or her time building these reports, but in the future, yeah. they, they won't necessarily do that. So what you're saying is that they will have more time to understand what these what these numbers yeah. are trying to tell them, which ostensibly, I'm extrapolating here that you mean that they'll have more of a deeper understanding mm. of what's actually going on and more time to be creative about potential deals or potential acquisition targets. Yeah. Um, but how, how do you see this future playing out? And, and, and how do you think humans can prepare for this shift? Um, well, I think that Look, I, I'm not sure there is a preparation, a special preparation. We will just, we will just be, we will just do what actually we are much better to do, rather than doing rot type of tasks. So that happened all the time in, if you look in uh, in history, and uh, like mechanization of agriculture. So. People started to do much nicer jobs, right? Supervising machines and drones and that go. And basically they are in front of a command center and make sure, you know, basically the machines work for them. I think it's kind of the same here. So the transformation of our jobs will be in understanding how we can interact with these machines, how we can give them commands and to do what we want them to do. But the essence of our jobs, I don't think the nature of our brain and how we process information is not going to change. Yeah, well, to go, to you, um, you talk about Act One was you know all, all about the enabling the bots, and but those bots don't go away. One of the things you said is you got to be careful about the agents. You don't want to give a agents all your credentials. The bots will protect them. Yeah, because they're, they're controllable. 
What technology foundations have you built over the last 10 years, whether it's RPA, which I think of sometimes as the, the plumbing, your computer vision capabilities, your orchestration, the machine learning and machine intelligence that you have, and many other pieces. What are the key components that will feed this agentic vision that you have today, and what are the things that you need your product teams to create, which didn't exist? Yeah, um, so I think we have the foundation. The way, the way we are managing robots and deploy robots today will be very similar for agents. So how you control access to robots, this is going to be similar. Who can run a robot, who can run an agent. How you can monitor thousands of robots will be similar, how you can monitor thousands of agents. All the audit trails that we use for robots will be similar for agents. So every application that an agent will touch, every everything an agent will decide will be fully auditable using our existing platform. We have the enterprise workflow, the long running workflow that can connect agents, robots, and people. Dead. Because we have we have them today. You define a process is a series of steps and you stitch the steps together. Some of the steps are robotic, some of the steps are agentic, and also you can call APIs, models, but you can stitch them into an enterprise workflow. We have this technology. Now, of course, we have to evolve our process orchestration technology to be capable of handling agents better, handling the interaction, agent to agent, agent to humans. And we are, we are working to build uh, more of this process definition in a human diagram, like a BPMN diagram, and adapt it to, for the agentic work. This is, this is a big work that we are doing. So we invest, we invest in process orchestration a lot. And also in combining the data of what robots are doing, what agents are doing, but also system data using our process mining. We aim to combine all of these data to give, to give an enterprise a 360 view of all the transactions that, uh, that happen into the enterprise. And of course, building the agent itself, we are introducing this uh, agent builder, which is a low code technology to build agents. And we aim that the persona that builds automations today, robots today, will be capable of building agents. Because I think it makes a lot of sense to deploy them together, to have agents and robots really working uh, side by side. And even like uh, Chandra of McKinsey said, they also say it's, it's basically a stepping stone for agents to use robots to, to perform to extract information from enterprise system, ground their, their outcome in real information, and also acting using robots. So agents will use robots to act on enterprise systems. Uh, is it fair to say that the, that the agents are sort of the high value systems of agency, the robots, um, maybe they don't get commoditized over time, but perhaps people are willing to pay less for robots and they want to maybe shift some of their budgets to agents? How do you see that sort of value uh, equation? I think the agent, the robots will be actually even more valuable to the people. Because without, uh, without a good set of robots, agents will become useless. Probably. I think on the contrary, I'm not sure if you can charge a lot more for an agent as an entity. I think the margin on the top of an LLM call will not be will not be big for an agent. And I think the value will be more in tools and in orchestration, actually. Building an agent in itself, deploying an agent in itself, I don't think will be as valuable as bringing the agent in a coordinated fashion with other agents, with other robots and people. You made this point in your keynote, it's somewhere in my notes about, uh, I, the way I wrote it down was being able to access multiple tool chains and, and orchestrate those agents so that they can take advantage yeah. of those tool chains. That's where you see the value. That's yes. a, and you see that as a high value piece of real estate in the application stack, presumably, yes. going forward. 
I see. How do you think about, because um, they're, uh, yeah, the Clippy joke, Microsoft uh, announces co-pilots, they're really single agents yes. from today. Benioff calls it Clippy, which is, is fun, uh, but it's somewhat true. It, it's not, it's, it's, it's not the vision that you're putting forth, but, but you've got Microsoft, Salesforce, I put Palantir in that category, all trying to do what, we, let's call it agentic. Maybe yeah. it is some, it's along some spectrum. So within their application, Oracle is another one, within their application domains, their workday I'm sure are same, they're going to be pushing agents. Explain your strategy to cut across horizontally and how you add value in that world of application stovepipes. So, as an SME, you rarely live inside only one platform. So you have to conduct work across multiple platforms. Two, three, ten, you know, business applications. This is very common. So, and in our world, I think most of our revenue comes from high value workflows that touch multiple business systems. Because we always we had to compete with like in application automations because most of the Excel provide macros and so on. Most of business applications have a form of in application, right? Yep. But when you go to cross the borders of different applications, it's a much more complicated business. So we are very happy to orchestrate and connect agents created by different application vendors in a very similar way that we use the, their APIs today. We have connectors to Salesforce, to SAP, to Microsoft Dynamics. A agent will be just a new form of connectors, but the layer, the workflow layer above the, above the applications, it's much more natural to be in our technology that is agnostic. We are the Switzerland of business yeah. applications <laughs> and we connect all of them. I'd like to um, lay out a scenario and have you say, yeah, that's about right, or no, Dave, you got it wrong, because you would do that for me. Uh, when I've written in the past that I have it right, you say, that's right, you're right. When we put forth the premise that you don't think is correct, you, you course correct. So these, what we see in the future, I talk about the application stack, is you have to have the connectors into the enterprise apps, both the analytic and the transactional application. Yeah. You have those, and they have to be two ways. I don't want to make copies all over the place. So eventually, I want to be able to push down to those. And then there's a data layer. I'll come back to that. Then you've got this agent control framework, the orchestrators working in concert with, with the bots. But those agents are able to access multi multiple tool chains and have their governed, the security. Yeah. They're able to be guided by top-down goals. Uh, I think of a, a tree. Uh, well, I want to uh, increase revenue, but I want to keep margins you know, I want to gain market share, but keep margins above 30%, whatever those top-down goals are, but then the agents can orchestrate bottoms-up outcomes. So far, so good? What about that data layer? Because I have all this disparate data, I have structured data, unstructured data, I have revenue, bookings, NRR, ARR, quarterly revenues, calendar year, um, fiscal year. How do I harmonize all that data? And what is that your role? Is that somebody else's role? Because I feel as though if the agents don't have harmonized data, that it's garbage in, garbage out. Help us understand that, yeah. that future. Actually, this is, uh, this is one of the area where the robots are the most helpful into, into presenting the agent exactly the data that the agent need in the format that the agent expect. Well, it's, if, um, like if you have an HR agent, right? And this agent, let's say uh, they have to send a, a gift to, to an employee on their birthday, okay? This uh, HR agent doesn't need access to salary level of that employee because it's not good. Someone can adversarially attack the agent. So, a robot will actually can go on behalf of, uh, you know, can provide the credential to, we can provide the credential to the robot. The robot will not spill out that credential ever because it's governed by rules. No, 
and will present to the agent exactly the information the agent needs, which is the birthday date for that employee. So in this way, we ground the agent into the enterprise data, but it's, and the enterprise data is dynamic. It depends, it's, I cannot put it all into a vector database. Robots will get dynamic current data to feed the agents. I think it's a very powerful concept. Yeah. Good. So here we are at Forward 2024. If all goes according to plan, what will we be, will we be talking about next year at Forward 2025? I think we are going to talk about uh, use cases. Right now we are in the early innings of deploying agentic automation. We are, we are seeing some patterns emerging, but we have to validate with customers in different industries creating, uh, you know, like a catalog of use cases, customer references, and gradually, you know, rolling over to, you know, like mainstream type of customers. Excellent. Well, Daniel, thank you so much for coming on theCUBE. Always a pleasure talking with you. Oh, yeah, likewise. Thank, thank you. you for having me, guys. Exactly. Thanks. I'm Rebecca Knight for Dave Vellante. Stay tuned for more of theCUBE's live coverage of UiPath Forward. You're watching theCUBE, the leader in enterprise tech news and analysis. Thank you.